In this video, we're going to be talking about angular momentum, how it's conserved, as well as angular impulse. I put this webcomic right here by XKCD, so this is Randall Monroe who did this. He's so clever. So I was like, that. what are you doing? I'm spinning counterclockwise. Each turn robs the planet of angular momentum, slowing its spin the tiniest bit and lengthening the night and pushing back the dawn, giving me a little bit more time here with you. Isn't that sweet? So let's remind ourselves what we do here. So do you remember the equation for linear momentum, which is P equals MV? Well, remember now in uh, rotational terms, we have an equivalent here. So instead of momentum, like linear momentum, we have angular momentum, which is L. So we're going to say L equals, and remember the rotational equivalent of mass is actually moment of inertia. And the rotational equivalent of a velocity here is actually angular velocity omega. So really we have this equation just L equals I omega. Okay, so I just want to point out, remember, that the angular momentum is the rotational equivalent of P. Right, so angular momentum, and we can call this L. All right, so here we go. And let's look at the units for things. So let's do angular velocity first. That's in radians per second. All right. Then we've got um, moment of inertia. Do you remember the equation for I goes uh, sigma mr squared? So that must be kilograms times distance squared, so meters squared. Now if we put this together then, if we want to figure out the units for angular momentum, we'll just multiply the units for i times omega. So in other words, kilogram meters squared radians per second. However, we often omit the radians. We often just, you know, ignore it. So we're going to say it's kilogram meters squared. That's just a unit for moment of inertia. We're going to say per second. So there we go. It'll be like this instead. So there we go, there's our equation. Now what's interesting though is that it's often conserved. So the total angular momentum, maybe I'll put this one down here, this is an important piece of information here. The total angular momentum is constant as long as there are no external net torques acting on it. Because remember that makes it accelerate. So remember our equation goes L equals I omega. And you remember that I contains mr squared. So it's like L equals some kind of well, some kind of m r squared, because that's what i is, times omega, okay, because this is what i is. The reason I put this down like this is I want us to concentrate on two things here. I want us to concentrate on r and omega, that if r gets bigger, if this thing is in a constant motion, okay, so total angular momentum is constant, as long as there's no external net torques acting on it, then what happens? Well, then this this value of L remains the same. So how can we use this? Well, you can use this for a, fig, a spinning figure skater. So someone who's spinning, for example, they have a radius of their arms. Right? So their arms are out at some certain R here. And what happens then? If they want to spin faster, what should they do? They should take their arms and make them smaller. So bring their arms in as they're rotating. Okay, so as they're spinning around, okay, you can see me spinning around here. As I'm spinning around, if I brought my arms in, what would that do? Well, assuming there's no external net torques, then that means as long as my mass stayed constant, which I'm assuming it did in this case, if R gets smaller, what happens to omega? Omega has to get bigger in order to keep L the same. So if R goes down, omega goes up. If R goes up, omega goes down. So this right here, let me just show you a uh, video. I think I have something actually prepared here, so let's take a look. So just take a look at this right here. So you see, so uh, she's spinning around. As she brings in her arms, she made her R value smaller. That means omega got bigger. And by the way, to slow down, what do you do? Bring your arms out again. So when she wants to actually stop spinning, she puts her arms out. Do you notice that? By putting her arms out, that made all the difference. Isn't that kind of cool? Now, um, this happens in really large things as well. So this is a neat story, but um, in uh, the year 1054, in China, um, some people, so they, they were looking up at the stars and they said, hey, look at that, there's a new moon out there. So it was actually brighter than the moon. So they looked at this and they're really good at mapping where things were. That's why we know it was in 1054. And they, you know, they saw this big bright thing and it lasted some days and after that it went down again and they couldn't see it anymore. What's interesting about it is if we know where to look, because the Chinese were so good at mapping out where it was, we can look now with our telescopes and see, and this is what we see. It's this thing here called the Crab Nebula. Now it looks like a big cloud of uh, 
dust and gases. Isn't it beautiful? So this is really what it looks like. And it's actually in 3D, so it's hard to imagine, but this is basically we're seeing the outer parts and the inner parts we can actually sort of see into it. But the reason I mention it here is because, hey, in astronomy, if our theories were correct, we thought, hey, you know what? Oh, we think this happened because the Chinese saw a black, um, not a black hole, a supernova. So if there was a supernova explosion, which is when a star collapses on its own, basically bounces off a solid neutron core, and then you know all the material gets just sent outwards. So it's sort of an implosion that turns into an explosion. Um, if that happened, you know, our theories went that, hey, there should be a thing called a neutron star that's in the center. And that thing in the center, then we figured, hey, you know what, it should be, we scientists figured, you know, it, there should be a neutron star, and we should be able to find it. What's beautiful about it, you can. If you look at the right place, you look right in the center of it, there is a neutron star that's spinning. Now, interestingly enough, this is just the remnants of a giant, super, super massive star. So imagine this big, big star. It used to be really big, but after it blew up, of course, a lot of pieces went missing. Yes, of course, but a lot of it also got collapsed and contracted and made more dense. So imagine that. This is our uh, situation, right, where we have constant angular momentum, and then what do we do? The star itself, other than the stuff that blew off, a lot of it actually got collapsed and compressed. So that stuff, remember, it took its radius and made it a lot smaller. What happens then? Well, that means if you take a, something that's way, way bigger than our sun and you collapse it to the size of a city, which is about, you know, about the size of a neutron star. So this one here, if you collapse it to the size of a city, what do you think that does to omega? Omega goes way up, doesn't it? So when a star normally rotates quite slowly, Turns out we look at the center of this particular one in the Crab Nebula, and we did, we found a neutron star, and we expected it to be spinning pretty fast, right? It actually spins, the one at the center of the Crab Nebula spins 30 times per second. It's called a pulsar, because it actually, the, the way we're lined up is like a pulse of light that sort of hits us. It's cool, isn't it? So spinning uh, figure skaters has to do with spinning neutron stars in the Crab Nebula, for example, after a supernova explosion. How awesome. All right, so let's look at this. We've got something called angular impulse as well. Remember the equation that we had for regular impulse? So for linear impulse, we had this quantity j, which was equal to the, um, well, we write f times delta t, which is equal to delta p. So this is the force times the change in time, which is also equal to the change in momentum. Well, we have an equivalent for angular impulse as well. So remember that P, for example, is just equal to MV, in linear terms at least, so we can say it's delta this. So what do we do then for our rotational equivalence? Well, J is going to be called delta L. That's going to be the angular impulse. Now, what's the equation going to be? Well, let's see. We have F. So what's the angular equivalent kind of? Well, it's torque. We still have a change in time, so it's delta T. And if we want to do delta P here, yes, of course we can do delta L, but we can break it open because we have delta MV. We can say it's delta, and remember the equivalent of uh, mass is actually I, and the equivalent of V is omega. So we could say it's also delta I omega. This is our equation right here for angular impulse. Now remember the angular impulse then is just a change in angular momentum, that's it. So what we've seen in this video, can you see that we've gone over angular momentum, this equation for it, how it's conserved and some of the neat things it does, and also just angular impulse, which is very similar to the linear impulse we've learned. It's just the angular version of the rotational equivalent.